Cool. Okay, sweet. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of, I'm going to work through the script here. So first off are just some packages um, for people who have done ordination stuff with R. You're probably familiar with uh, vegan. So that's where, that's a package that a lot of people use for, for ordination, specifically ecology related stuff. Um, and I guess briefly, so packages kind of build on the base functionality of R. Um, people have kind of written these packages to give you some easier um, ways of, of using R. Um, and so <clears throat> a lot of them are really useful and really commonly used. So we're gonna use ggplot2, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, to do some plotting. Um, and then vegan has a, some 3D functionality too for visualization, so we'll use that as well. Um, and I'm going to work with this Dune data set, which is um, some Dutch Dune meadow plots. So we're looking, they're basically um, meadow ecosystems, and we'll be looking at the plant communities in those ecosystems. And there's some environmental variables about what kind of management um, practices are used in those areas and a little bit of stuff about the soils. <clears throat> so a quick review of what kind of David showed us. So we could start off talking about a one dimensional space, right? And so we could say that plot one has zero of this species one, right? So we'll just say that we're doing count data. So we'll say there are zero of species one in plot one. And in plot two, there are three of species one. And in plot three, there are six of species one, right? So that'd be really simple. Then we could add an extra dimension to that. So we see plot one still has zero of species one, but now we're adding our second dimension and that is the abundance of species two. And so in plot one, there are five of species two. Plot two, we still have three of species one, but now we have three of species two as well. And so you can see how we can add dimensionality to these things. And if we added a third species to that plot, then we would have three dimensions. And you can see up here, this is kind of specifying the coordinates, right? So right now we have three coordinates, an X, a Y, and a Z, but we could imagine how we could continue to add additional dimensions to this. Um, we can't really visualize beyond that third dimension, but in practicality, we could add some. Um, and so this is kind of useful. You can look at um, the proximity of plots one and two, and that tells us a little bit about the species composition in these plots. So it looks like plot one and plot two have a, more of a similar species composition than plot one does with plot three, right? Um, and so <clears throat> this is called plots and species space, which David mentioned, and it's kind of the most common way of ordinating things. You'll, you'll see that the most. And so species space, basically meaning that we're defining the space, our axes are these species, right? So we're in a species space, and what do we have in the, space, in the species space? We have plots, so that's referred to as plots in species space. Um, but David showed an example, you could also have plots in environmental space. So if we had environmental data on these plots, for instance, of B horizon pH, B horizon nitrogen, and B horizon calcium, we could also have plots in an environmental space. Um, and similarly, you could have species in trait space, which is pretty cool. You don't see as much of that, but just to kind of make you aware of how all the different possibilities for, for ordinating things. Um, so we could see that species one here seems to have kind of small petal lengths, large sepal lengths, and smaller petal widths, right? So we can ordinate like that. So um, for this, um, presentation, I'm gonna talk about plots and species space because it's, I think, one of the easier ways to think about these and it's really common. Um, so we could, we have three dimensions here, but we could continue to add dimensions, right? <clears throat> and so let's look at the data set that we're gonna use. It's this Dune data set. So we can see that the rows here, these are the plots. So this is, um, plot one here, and in plot one, we have acamil, achillomillifolium, 
there's one of those and it looks like there's there aren't any other plants found there and then plot two there's three counts of a kilomillifolium and there's a couple other species there right so let's look at the dimensions of dune so um, we see that it reports that there are 20 rows and 30 columns in this so how many can anybody guess how many dimensions we're looking at so um, in our species space how many how many dimensions will our full data set have 20 yeah so 20 is there will be our number of plots and our dimensions will be 30 we've got 30 species so if we look at this so species one species two species three we're going to get up to 30 um, dimensions and within those 30 dimensions we're going to locate 20 different plots within that space so i'll just kind of cut to the chase of what nmds is going to do for us um, so here's kind of a, a, a kind of end result nmds right <clears throat> and so what we're seeing here these circles are plots and the colors of the plots tell the management type of that area so each one of these circles is a meadow ecosystem that they collected plants from and these four letter words are the actual species themselves so with these plots we see a little cluster of plots here right that are all the same management type and we see these three plots appear to have very similar species composition within them and we see the species around them. And so that means that those species tend to associate with those plots. You'd expect in those plots, there's probably a high abundance of those species. And we see this uh, vector here labeled A1, and that's the depth of the A1 soil horizon. And so in this area of the ordination where that vector is pointing to, there are larger A1 values. So there's deeper A1 horizons in that area. So these species here are associated with deep A1 horizons, and these plots here are associated with deep A1 horizons. And alternatively, up in this other area, these are associated with shallower A1 horizons. So those plots tend to have shallower A1 horizons, and the species tend to be associated with um, shallower A1 horizons. And these are kind of general trends, right? It, it doesn't mean that this plot over here can't have the deepest A1 horizon, but it's you're kind of using some regression techniques. And we'll talk about how we actually um, get the direction and the magnitude of, of that environmental vector. So you can produce a figure like this with other ordination techniques like PCA, and, and there are a bunch of different options for ordinating. So why would we use NMDS to create this ordination? Um, one of the benefits is that it doesn't have an assumption of linear relationships between variables and there commonly aren't linear relationships with um, community data, um, especially abundance. We have a lot of zeros. And so that's a really nice aspect of it. It allows us to use any distance measure. And so PCA is restricted to uh, just Euclidean distance. And so in our NMDS, we'll be able to use something more appropriate like Bray Curtis that uh, David mentioned. And then this also uses ranked distances, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but um, ranked distances is what makes this method non-metric. And so something like Kruskal Wallace that also uses ranked distances, um, it's useful for some of these kind of non-linear relationships and it helps us describe um, environmental variables and species. So the disadvantages, um, which from what I've read, really aren't, aren't as much of disadvantages as they used to be. One is it's computationally intensive, but with improved computing, that's not so much of an issue. And then the other one historically has also been um, finding local minima, which we'll talk a little bit. So the NMDS tries to find a solution um, and there's, the possibility that the solution that it finds is only if you picture yourself in kind of a mountain landscape and it finds some summit that might only be the local summit and there's some larger peak somewhere else that this algorithm didn't find but with improved algorithms um, that concern is also kind of reduced so 
it's a great tool for community data. I think it's kind of the go-to ordination technique for, for community abundance data. Um, and so for the overall process of how we're gonna run this, we're gonna start off, so we're working in a 30 dimensional space. So we're gonna start off with our 30 dimensions and we're gonna tell the NMDS, how many dimensions do we want for our solution? And commonly you'll, you'll select like from one uh, dimension up to six dimensions and see what the different options are that we could use. And we'll choose the one that is most appropriate for us. And then you would move on to plotting what those results look like. Um, so let's look at actually running an NMDS. So we have 30 dimensions right now, right? And David showed us a, uh, a distance matrix already. And so what we did here was we used um, this vegan function, vegdist, and we're calculating the distances um, between plots, right? So on our rows here, here's plot three, and here's plot one here. So this value here is comparing plot three and plot one. What is the distance between those points in 30 dimensional space? And it's giving us a Bray Curtis distance, and the Bray Curtis distance is a proportional distance. It kind of tells us how different are these compared to how different they could potentially be. And so Bray Curtis goes from zero to one. One would be these plots are as different as they could possibly be, and zero is these plots are exactly the same. So when we look here, this value is comparing plot three to plot one, and this value here is comparing plot three to plot two. And so what this would tell us here is that plot three is more similar to plot two than plot three is to plot one, because this value here, this distance is smaller, right? So, um, and what the ranked part of NMDS is, is right now we have 30 dimensional space and we're using Bray Curtis distance, but now we're going to assign ranks to these distances rather than the distances being absolute distances. So let's look at um, this row here, four. So this is plot four, and we're gonna compare plot four to plot one, plot two, and plot three. So the one, the plot that plot four is most similar to is plot three with a value of 0.27. And so if we were doing ranked distances, that would be number one. That is the closest plot to plot three. So we're kind of just pretending right now that that only this, this row here four exists. We're kind of ignoring the rest of our matrix, our distance matrix. So if we're assigning rank distance to just these three values, this would be rank one, this is the closest. This is would be ranked two, that's the second closest. And this here would be rank three, it's the third closest plot. And in reality, we would apply that to our whole distance matrix here. The closest value would be one and it would go all the way, whatever the last comparison is would be whatever that number is. So that's really useful. And 30 dimensional space is really informative. It tells us kind of like if we're looking at this three dimensional space. So if we're looking at our full dimension, it tells us it's kind of our best description of the species composition in a plot. And it's also the best description of what plots are similar to each other. But 30 dimensional space is enormous and impossible to uh, Kind of visualize that. So we need to reduce that down into an interpretable number of dimensions and that's usually two or three dimensions. So NMDS gives us a way of reducing down our number of dimensions um, and what happens is when you lose, when you reduce the number of dimensions from 30 down to say one, two, three, things like that, you can only represent that relationship so well um, in that reduced number of dimensions. And the information that's lost during that process is what's called stress. And we'll get more into what exactly stress is, but it's kind of how, how much information was lost when we tried to reduce the, the dimensions. Um, so let's look at actually running an NMDS in R. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna, save our results in this thing called NMDS Dune 1. So we just come up with a name, whatever you want. And then we'll use this vegan function called Meta MDS. Here we name our data set. So we're using the Dune data set. 
we name our distance, which is Bray Curtis distance, and then we name the number of dimensions, which is the k value here. So this is going to be a one dimensional solution. And try is the number of times that you want this NMDS to try to find a solution to this. So it's, it keeps doing the same process over and over and seeing if it can find a better solution. Um, and it gives you an option to auto transform your data, which can be a good idea. And I didn't go over transforming your data before this, but you should look at the skew and kurtosis and things like that in your data and consider transforming um, log transformations can be really useful. So definitely look into that. And later on in this presentation, I'll talk about um, some options that Vegan has for doing transformations in a really convenient way. Um, so let's run this one dimensional solution. And we see here, this is the amount of stress. So we talked about stress is kind of how much information was lost during this process, right? And we're looking for stress values to be 0 0.20 or lower, preferably lower. Um, and we're seeing a lot of high values here. And we'll see that this runs 250 times because we told it to try 250 times. And so this thing ran 250 times. And at the end, it said no convergence, which basically means it's not finding a stable solution. It's trying to reconfigure these plots in a way that maintains that original relationship. And it's, it's unable to do that with one dimension. And you can imagine going from 30 dimensions to one dimension is really kind of unrealistic, really challenging, unless you had a very simple kind of data set. So that's, that's unsuccessful. And let's just run this whole thing. So we're gonna run um, solutions ranging from one to six dimensions. And this runs fairly quick. This Dune data set isn't huge, but I could imagine um, with some of the data sets that you're working with, with like microbial stuff, this, this could take quite a while, especially a, a six dimensional solution. So, um, so we'll see, let's look at the three dimensional solution. So now if we run the three dimensional solution again, we can see these values are much smaller looking at 0 0.07, 0 0.07. And if we go kind of towards the end, we see a lot of values that are similar, whereas in the other one, they, the values were all high and they were ranging. It was finding different solutions each time, but we're seeing pretty consistent stress values around 0 0.076 seems to be popping up a lot, 0 0.07. So it keeps finding the same solution and that gives you some confidence that your NMDS is it's deciding to configure your plots in the same ways each time. And it's a reliable way of, of placing those. And- Nate, I have a quick question. Yep. Does it pick out of your 250 runs, the one with the least amount of stress to then give you that figure at the end or does it pick the last one that it ran? Yeah, so it's looking for, I believe it's looking for kind of a, a the lowest thing that it keeps finding. So it wants to keep finding the same solution. And it, I think you could potentially have a low value, but if it can't keep finding that, then then that would likely be an issue. It's not, that's kind of the convergence thing. It wants a lot of its attempts to end up kind of at that same summit or valley, however you want to think about it. But yeah, that's converging or it keeps finding the same solution. So, but yeah, it's trying, it's trying to do that with the lowest stress solution. Um, so let's look at a stress plot and we'll get kind of a, where did that go? Whoa, sorry. Okay, so here's our stress plot, right? And so what we're looking at here is on the x-axis is our observed dissimilarity. And that was in our 30 dimensional space, right? So the x-axis is our Bray Curtis distance. And on the y-axis is our final solution, our ordination distance. And your ordination distance is always measured in Euclidean distance because when we look at an ordination solution, we look and interpret things in Euclidean distance. So when two plots look close to each other, we want that to mean that they're similar to each other. So we're always, our ordination distance is always using Euclidean distance. And what we want to happen is that when our 
original 30 dimensional Bray Curtis distance is small, it should also be small for our ordination distance, right? And so let me see if I can. Hey, can I uh, ask a quick question about that? Yeah. So the, the Euclidean distance that we're using here is the Euclidean distance between those points on the M NMDS plot, right? It's not, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So the y-axis, that's the Euclidean distance on our on our NMDS. Yep. And the the x-axis is that 30-dimensional break Curtis distance, but ranked, right? So it's not that absolute distance, it's that ranked distance. And so let's see if I can draw on this thing. So we're comparing these things, right? And we have a, a rank. So we could put rank one here. And so that would be our break hardest distance, this is our smallest break hardest distance. It was rank one, like we did that example where we ranked things. Well, we also want that to be our smallest ordination Euclidean distance, right? And then our second distance should be two. And we want that to be our second smallest break Curtis distance and also our second smallest Euclidean distance in our NMDS solution. And then we want three to be here and it creates this monotonic line, this straight line, <clears throat> where when Bray Curtis distance increases, Euclidean distance should increase in our NMDS solution. But unfortunately, when you reduce dimensions, you lose a little bit of ability to represent things. So what if four was here? It's increased in Bray Curtis distance, but it's decreased in our Euclidean distance, right? And so that means that it's, it's not being represented in the right place. And stress is kind of a measure of how far off. We would need four to be up there to be in the correct monotonic uh, location. And so stress is kind of a sum of all the points. Every time it has to move a point, it's, it's like, this isn't actually in the right place. We need to move that, we need to move this. That adds up and creates stress in your solution. So that's, that's how stress is calculated. And let's see here. So then we ran six, um, six NMDSs, right? So let's look at, at what these solutions came out to. So on our x-axis here, this is the number of, of dimensions in our solution. So we see our one-dimensional solution and on our y-axis is the amount of stress. Our one-dimensional solution has a lot of stress, which makes sense when you go from 30 dimensions to one dimension, that one dimension is going to have a lot of stress. As you add dimensions, you decrease the stress. And that also makes sense. Once you got to 30 dimensions, you'd be able to perfectly represent this thing again, and you have no stress. Um, <clears throat> so now our job is deciding what, what dimensional solution is, is the best to use. When we add more dimensions, it, cr it creates difficulty interpreting things. If we had a dimension or a solution that was still in six dimensions, we still can't really look at that and understand it. So that's not really useful. Um, but we also don't want a ton of stress because that means our solution is somewhat unreliable. So the rule for this is, this is a, a vector of the stress. So this number here is the one dimension. If we look at dimension one, it's up around 0.27 stress. So we see that here. And then this next one is our two dimensional solution. 0.118 is the stress. And so we continue to add dimensions. We start at one dimension and we look at that. And we say, if we add one dimension, do we significantly reduce the amount of stress? Are we really improving our visualization of this? And the rule of thumb is that if you decrease the stress by 0 0.05, then it's worthwhile to add another dimension to your solution. So let's look at the first. We start off at one dimension. We've got 0.276. Now, if we add one dimension, we decrease the stress by much more than 0 0.05. So that's a worthwhile um, decrease, or that's a worthwhile uh, to increase the dimensions there. Now we're at two dimensions. Should we change to three dimensions? Well, do we decrease the stress by 0 0.05 or more? And in this, in this case, we don't. It would need to be 0 0.068 or lower um, for us to add that third dimension. So we'll stay at two dimensions in this solution. And so this stuff's all kind of saved in your NMDS output. So we originally called this thing NMDS um, to Dune. And when you put that dollar sign there, like David was showing us, um, 
the class of these things are a little more complicated. Like, um, I'll show you the class. So the class of an NMDS Dune 2 is a meta MDS. So it's not one that David showed us. It's a little more complicated, but it has information stored in it. And one of the pieces of information it has stored is the stress. And so we can run the stress there. And it tells us it's 0.118. So what does that, what does that mean? So we can evaluate our stress. Stress from 0.05 and lower is excellent. I've never seen an ordination published that has stress that low. 0.05 to 0.1, they call good. I don't know if I've ever seen one that low either, but that would be really great. That means that your solution is really doing a great job representing those distances and patterns in your data that were originally described in 30 dimensions. And then from 0.1 to 0.2 is, is probably more likely where you find yourself. Um, and you start to have a little bit of trouble relying on this information as you get up to 0.2. Um, beyond 0.2 is considered kind of unreliable. So with values approaching 0.2, you're starting to be a little suspicious when two points are close to each other. Is that, were they really supposed to be close to each other in 30 dimensions or is that kind of misleading? So um, you should treat those solutions with a little bit of caution when they start getting up towards 0.2. I have a quick question. Yep. Just going back to where you checked the class type of your solution. Yeah. How do you look and see what sort of information is held within that um, class type? Yeah, so um, I don't know too much about that meta MDS class type, but if we went to NMDS Dune 2 and then did our dollar sign, it gives us all these options of, of what is stored in here. And so a lot of these, I don't know what they mean, but I can tell you, we'll look at what points are and, um, and we'll look at what species are. And there's a lot of other information stored in there that I'm sure you can find some documentation on. Cool. Would you, would you be able to get all of what those are in the, like in the help of for M NMDS? Yeah. Or yeah. we would go for that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like David showed us if we mm -hmm. did uh, meta, MDS, that would bring up, oh, I actually could push one. Oh, because it's, sorry. I forgot to talk about the, uh, the structure function, STR. That's that's always really handy. That'll, that'll show you everything that's stored in that object too. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, so we can look at the structure and a lot of it, you know, it's pretty, pretty complicated, but um, we will use the points and we will use the, the species um, in a little you bit. You can see that structure information over in the global environment too, right? In our studio, is that correct? I believe you can, yeah, if you expand these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, so now we've, we've run an NMDS and we've decided what solution is best for us. So now we'd be on to kind of creating our visual of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, proceed with a three dimensional solution rather than the two dimensional solution. Um, based on the stress, we should choose the two dimensional solution, but it's a little bit more interesting for plotting. And it's pretty common, especially with complex data sets to need to use a three dimensional solution. So it's good to know how that works. Um, so when we start plotting, uh, here's a reminder of what our, our um, visual is going to look like. The first thing to add are the actual plots themselves, which um, Vegan refers to as sites. And so that, that is stored within your NMDS results because it's essential. That's how it decided what the stress was, right? The whole process was to decide where should we position all of these plots relative to each other to maintain the original kind of structure of our data set. Um, so we can look at the site scores here and it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, so if we did NMDS Dune 3 points and ran that, this shows here's plot one and these are the coordinates for plot one. So we've got our three different dimensions and the code here 
is just a little um, a little bit of formatting stuff. We're kind of extracting scores and putting them into a data frame. And I'll share this with all of you so you can see how that works. But we're just getting out those those site scores so that we know how to plot those. And then we'll move on to getting our species scores. And so the species scores are also stored within our um, NMDS solution. And the way that the species scores are determined is by using weighted averaging. And so we see that this plot here has the highest NMDS one score, right? It's about 1.1 or something like that. And so that heavily weights the NMDS axis. Um, this plot here weights that NMDS axis, axis one heavily. And so we use its axis score as a weight. So the weighting for this plot is 1.1, let's say. And so you'd look at the species in here. So if we were trying to, to determine the species score for this Junkardi, this Junkus species, we would say how much abundance of this species is in this plot, and we'd multiply it by the weight of that plot, that 1.1. And then we'd go to the next plot, we'd say this plot here has about a weight of maybe 1.05 or something like that. How much Junkus is in that plot and multiply that by that 1.05. You'd keep doing that for all the plots and then you divide that by your total abundance of that species and it ends up giving you an NMDS axis score. And then you would do that for the axis two and then you'd have your two dimensions and you could represent it on this figure. So that's how um, species scores are determined. And in just kind of a more basic way, it's, it's kind of it's associated with the correlation. So this part of these high NMDS axis one scores are correlated with plots that have a lot of this species, right? And so that's how that species score gets out there. Nate, can I, may I ask you a question? Yeah. So it sounds like, uh, as with every statistical test, but this would be especially susceptible to outliers in your data because of that kind of weighting. Um, so what kind of, things do you suggest people do to look at their data before they do a test like an NMDS to try to figure out if they have outliers before they begin? Yeah. Um, so I guess you, you definitely want to look at your skew and kurtosis and things like that. Um, and you can do, you know, log transformation or whatever transformation improves um, those values. Then there's also, um, which I didn't talk about commonly, you reduce rare species in your data set. So species that appear in less than 5% of your plots, you generally remove those from the data set. And because um, rare species are so common, you know, there's only a few like really abundant species. Um, for my master's work, I, th I think I went from like 230 species down to like 80 species. Um, when you remove species that are only within 5% or more of your plots. So you can lose a lot of species through that. Um, <clears throat> but some of the outlier stuff can be um, reduced a little bit by using these ranked distances. So that can help um, alleviate some of those issues as well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we were having a kind of offline chat about that 5% or less. Thing. I'm not, I, I think maybe our group, we should actually look into, I, I, I don't think people tend to do that in microbial data sets. I think you'd lose a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, I mean, we have these just very, very skewed distributions. I mean, I know all species abundance are, but like extra super skewed to be very quantitative about it. Um, so, I wonder, I think we should maybe look into that and think more about that for our type of data. But yeah, thank you for, I think it just kind of want to all be aware, like data exploration pre pre uh, is important as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. David, do you have anything to add to that? Um. I mean, what Nate said is accurate about skew and kurtosis and, and removing rare species. Uh, I'm not familiar with microbial stuff, so I, I I can try to think about that a little bit. Maybe if I come up with anything, I'll let you know. Yeah. So we yeah. did a trial. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stacey. 
um, RJ up at work had done a trial where he was looking into this. And for one of our data sets, we had 15,000 ASVs. And when we removed 5% or things that were present in less than 5% of the samples or something, it removed like 14,000 of those ASVs. So definitely important to look into that for yeah. our okay. type of data. Yeah. yeah, I think especially people who, who um, have taken Rich Smith's class, we work with um, Bruce McCune, the McCune and Grace, um, what is it called? Analysis of ecological data or something like that. Maybe that's the name of the class, I forget. But anyways, um, it seems like Bruce McCune's interpretation of doing some of this stuff is different than uh the guy his name's yari oksanen and he made vegan and i think he's kind of another one of the authorities on you know running ordinations um and they seem to have a little bit of different opinion on some of these things i i don't see as many people talking about reducing removing the rare species in the vegan world but bruce McCune's definitely a proponent of that so yeah right it's a good reminder that statistics is also an experiment yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right thanks i'll let you keep going i appreciate you digressing for that yeah um right so okay so we calculate our species scores here and this is um just the same thing we're just kind of extracting those species scores and putting them in a nice little data frame that's going to make it easier for plotting in the future and then there's the environmental vectors. Um, and so we just have one environmental vector with this data set. Uh, it's this A1, uh, which is the depth of the A1 horizon. And so there's both magnitude and direction for this. The direction points to where um, the A1 horizons are largest. Um, and then the, there's a length associated with this vector. If we had other environmental vectors, you'd see that they'd, they'd have different lengths. Um, and the length is associated with the correlation. And so the way that this is done is you run a linear model. Um, the response is the A1 horizon and the predictors are both the NMDS1 and NMDS2. And so that gives you some coefficients um, for the NMDS1 and 2. Those end up determining the direction of the arrow and the strength of the correlation is the length of the arrow. Um, so once again, to me, and I, I've talked to David about this too, those, that and the weighted averaging thing, they're kind of associated, they're kind of different, different calculations, but it's basically saying our plots over here, our plots over here generally have deeper A1 horizons and our plots over here, you know, so it's kind of a correlation um, between your NMDS axis scores and the plots, um, the value of the A1 plots. Uh, or the values, the A1 value in those plots. So, um, and a note on environmental variables, they can be um, calculated. There, there are a lot of different environmental variables and the units can be very different. You could be looking at pH, you could have like canopy cover, you could have a concentration of something. And so some of your values might be uh, 0.1, but that might be really large value for that um, measure, you know, and the other value might be in the thousands, but that might be really low. And so a common way to deal with that is to uh, standardize by the max value. So if we're looking at uh, soil calcium, the highest soil calcium value would be one and everything else would be below that because you would divide every value by that max value, right? Um, and so that's a good way to get everything between zero and one. And now the scale of these environmental variables are all comparable to each other. Um, and vegan has a really cool um, function here using this, this deco stand. So I encourage you to, to look at the documentation on that. Um, <clears throat> it's a really simple way. You just say method we want to relativize by max. <clears throat> the alternative for doing that using R is much, requires much more. Um, coding and so that's really useful and i encourage you to also use that on your um, species data too um, to check out some of the options using that um, and so this end fit function here this is just doing that linear model that we talked about using the linear model to determine the direction of that arrow and using the correlation to calculate the distance of that arrow 
And we're doing the same stuff here. We're just kind of extracting those values and putting them into a data frame. And we can also, um, we see the permutations here, 999. And so using our permutations, we can calculate a p-value for these things. So we see that um, this A1 value, this is an important environmental variable. If we had more environmental variables, we might see that some aren't very important. Um, and you know, we have our three dimensions associated with these. So <clears throat> the plotting is um, using ggplot. And so I'll share my code with you. Um, it takes a little bit to get familiar with the ggplot syntax, but we've extracted all these things. We have our species scores, we have our site scores, and we have an environmental variable. So we have all the pieces now extracted into some nice tables and they're kind of ready to use. And so, you know, first we plot um, these sites. It's kind of the bare bones of this thing. That's what our NMBS originally was trying to figure out where should we put these plots uh, relative to each other. And you'll see here, we're looking at axis one and axis two, right? Um, now we're using a three-dimensional solution. Um, and so once you go through and, and create your plots for axis one and two, you would go back through and you could change this value here to a three and make sure you change, you know, you have other instances of it, but change those. And then you can create graphs for one verse two, one verse three, two verse three. And obviously um, there's some kind of compromise by looking at these things individually. You're not seeing it all in one, one moving piece, um, but we will look at a three dimensional option. But I will note that ggplot um, has a lot of functionality for making things visually appealing and, and just look, you know, lots of options for changing the visuals of things. And so despite only being able to look at two dimensions at a time, sometimes it's as good as looking at three dimensions at a time. Um, so then we add the species scores onto this. And then finally, we add our environmental variable onto that. Um, <clears throat> And so if we look at this here, we're seeing different management types. And so BF here in the, the reddish is biological farming. So remember, we're looking at meadow plots. So BF is this biological farming. HF is hobby farming. So that's the green here. Um, the bluish is nature conservation management. And we see that those are quite a bit different than the other ones. And then standard farming kind of up here. And so we're seeing kind of clustering, things are clustering by the colors. So we're seeing that the management type does impact the species composition of these sites. Um, but there's definitely some overlap. I mean, overlap here with the red and the green and the green and the purple here. So let's look at, uh, at a three-dimensional solution. Oh, and I, one other thing I wanna mention, it's really important, I probably should have mentioned it earlier, is that NMDS axes are really different than PCA, like David mentioned. So PCA, we had this cloud of data, and then we kind of, he skewered the bacon, right, through the most variation, and then he went orthogonal to that in the second most variation. Well, NMDS axes are totally random, and they're basically meaningless. We told NMDS, we want a one-dimensional solution, we want a two-dimensional solution, we want a three-dimensional solution, and you tell it how many dimensions, and then it just tries to figure out where to put these points to maintain that original kind of relationships and structures in our 30-dimensional solution. So these axes don't really, they don't mean anything, and you see commonly with PCAs and some other ordinations, they'll say the amount of variation explained by an axis, and you can see how when David skewered through that, that explained a large amount of the variation, and you could uh, describe that. With NMDS, um, Bruce McCune does, does uh, use the amount of variance explained by NMDS axes, but Vegan doesn't give you any options for calculating that, and uh, the developer of it is pretty emphatic that these axes are meaningless, and you should never be reporting the amount of variance explained by an NMDS axis, so um, that's really important. And yeah, so let's look at the three-dimensional solution. And so this is also, this is using um, vegan 3D. Let's 
So now we have a three dimensional representation and we see that a lot of that overlap that we were seeing before is not actually what it looked like. So this biological farming, this is this green here. It doesn't have a uh, ellipse around it because I think you need more than three points for them to put an ellipse. But it looked like we had overlap in our two dimensional solution. But when we look at this in the third dimension, we see that there's not actually overlap there. There's actually very little overlap between um, these two, which standard farming and hobby farming. It looks like there's a, just kind of one point that actually overlaps there. So those communities are probably somewhat different. We see that the biological um, or the nature um, management is quite different than everything else. And so using three dimensions can be really useful at seeing um, exactly what's going on. But I will note that when you have lots, like we have four categories for our management. When you have lots of different categories, like I'm dealing with different forest types and lots of different, like we have 100, 100 or up to 200 plots that we're looking at, these 3D ordinations can get so chaotic that it's really not any better than looking at a two dimensional thing because you can't, you can hardly tell what's going on. Um, and the last thing would just be, <clears throat> there's this RGL widget function, which you can't run in um, our studio, but um, for those of you who have worked with R Markdown, this is a really nice format where you can publish this to an HTML file very easily. <clears throat> and with that, we can actually zoom in to these things, zoom in, zoom out, and uh, <clears throat> it's a nice, easy, publishable script too, so we can kind of see exactly what's going on see that there's really just this one point here is overlapping but the rest of that community they're in similar ordination spaces but they appear to be somewhat different potentially so yeah that's that's about what i have so hopefully that was useful as anyone have any questions In that three-dimensional figure you just showed us with the ellipses, were those like confidence intervals or are they? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have explained that. Yeah, so those are 95% um, confidence intervals, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. and can yeah. it not create those in two-dimensional space for some reason or? You can come up with those, yeah, so, um, so yeah, that's a good, good question. So I was using, um, this plot here is created using ggplot. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of benefits to ggplot, um, just how versatile it is. And there's a ton of docu documentation and you can basically make the plots look however you want them, yeah. if you can figure it out. Um, but but uh, Vegan offers their own kind of graphing options, which aren't as um, versatile, but they everything's kind of contained nicely. Like you see, um, before when we had to extract all these scores into different data tables and get them all ready to go to plug them into vegan, well, uh, or to plug into ggplot. Yeah. When you're working with vegan, they're kind of like, they're compatible because you produced these NMDSs in vegan and now if you use the vegan graphics options, it kind of knows how to interpret these meta MDS um, structures and things like that. So there's a lot less that you have to provide it, but there's um, some limitation to how much manipulation of, of those graphics that you can do. And so that's what you're seeing here is, uh, it's a little bit simpler to, to tell it um, what to do. And you can do that for two dimensions and you can create those 95% confidence interval ellipses with, with that, yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. What other questions people have? I don't have any right now, but I'm sure once I take a look at this, I will have some. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll send you guys this code. And yeah, and if, if anyone has any MD, NMDS questions, just let me know. So I actually do have another one for you, um, kind of based on the, the fact that you don't have any measure of how important the axes are. And so while you can create a p-value around saying like, 
the depth of the A horizon was really important for explaining distribution of species. How do I know if, even, even though I know that that's important to the data, how do I know that the data are actually, like that that's actually important at all? If, if, if really in reality somehow I could figure out, well, this, like the, this axis isn't actually, this is explaining 2% of the variance, but that 2% yeah. is really well explained by A horizon. Well, I probably want to write that paper differently than I want to write one where I know that that axis is explaining 90% of the variance. So is there, um, I mean, I know this was an NMDS lesson and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I guess I am, so sorry, you can be like, pass. But, um, you know, was there another better tool we, that we could use that we can get variants on those axes? Yeah, so there are ways um, of getting the variance explained by the axes, and it is explained, I don't think in the vegan documentation, but if you get, in, get into some of the uh, darker corners of forums out there, you'll find this guy, Yari Aksanen, and he does explain how to calculate that. And he basically says, if you have a reviewer who's dumb enough to require you to use that, then this is how you do it, but you should never do it, is his opinion. But um, Well, yeah. I, guess, I guess then, I mean, I, so I guess this, my question in a sense takes us outside of NMDS, but mm -hmm. to you guys' knowledge, like, and would there be an, another tool that, that would give us a lot of the same benefits of NMDS, but that actually can partition variants along the axes. Isn't this like, where, you know, what's is this that? where like a Permanova would come in? Well, it is, may, may, maybe. Uh, but then um, you're saying I mean, things are significantly different, but not how much of the trend they explain, right? Um, next week, I'm going to talk about a technique called partial least squares regression, which, which is um, a way to, so essentially you have a matrix of predictor variables, x's, and then a matrix of um, response variables, y's, and you, um, you basically you perform kind of like a PCA on both of them separately. And so you reduce the dimensionality on both of those. And then you can correlate axes from both of those with each other. And so that's, that's kind of one, one approach to that. I mean, I, I just, I just like to make the point, um, and Nate was alluding to this, that a lot of these analyses, I mean, no, no statistical analysis is perfect. Um, Nate brought up a bunch of flaws with NMBS, even though it's a great, really, really great choice. There's still, you know, <clears throat> stress considerations and, um, and whatnot. So uh, unfortunately, I think still a lot of it is kind of eyeballing it and saying, well, this arrow points this direction and it's associated with this plot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, th thanks. Thanks for that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. From what I can tell, um, NMDS is like the pinnacle of not being able to explain the variance on the axes because of the way that the axes are created because mm -hmm. they're kind of just you randomly put these axes in and then just try to move the points around until you find the best configuration so um yeah i've i've seen this guy yari Aksanen talk about other ordinations and he's not <clears throat> he's not fond of explaining variance on the axes for several of them i think uh, like pca is great because you're actually that's kind of inherent to it mm -hmm. but uh for nmds yeah he, he's not a fan and i think it's one of those trade-off situations where you get a lot of use for community data out of nmds but yeah definitely it would be nice to know like is is access two and three important at all should i even be looking at that or you know right kind of yeah or like if you're explaining so little the variance anyway then maybe talking about what what explains what the patterns you saw isn't that important, but I guess we'll we'll just wait till the next statistical genius comes along and helps us with that. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you guys doing this today.
Um, this was this was really enlightening. You guys went way deeper into the theory than I thought you would. So I I personally really loved that, and I'm seeing lots of heads like bobbing in agreement. So all the Lucases are on board <laughs> today. Um, cool. Any any final comments from anybody for for the guys? Questions. Just a big thank you. Yeah, this was super cool. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So um, if, and David just alluded to um, teaching next week on partial least squares regression and Permanova, the so two more tools that are going to be pretty useful to us. So um, I guess I need to hear from people now if you're just like, I can't, I need, I'm freaking out. I need to just keep moving on my thing so that David doesn't, you know, spend time preparing something that um, that we don't want. But I would listen to it myself. So <laughs> I don't know if other people are feeling like they that'll be useful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, awesome. I would listen in. Good. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, I well, think Permanova would be great because Chime has that as like an automatic, well, not an automatic output, but it's one of the things you can do in Chime. And I could definitely use a refresher on like theory like, and what it's doing and what it tells you. Totally. So that'd be great. Totally. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. Thank you guys. David, do you have any, um, like, should we be, especially if we're not reading a paper for Monday, we may have a little bit more bandwidth. If, like if people want to read a paper on Permanova, would we be going to like Marty Anderson's papers or a suggestion? Oh, you're muted somehow. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Anderson's paper is the one that explains it all, but to be completely honest, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a lot of um, the theory and what I hope is a, is a clear way with a lot of graphical stuff. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. We can, if you, you guys have questions coding later that may be the place to put the work in okay cool great great well we're off the